Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, the topic for today is 12 easy ways to prevent uh, memory loss and how to get started now. You might be wondering who am I for all those new people? Um, so my name is Steve Ledvina. I'm a certified health and wellness coach. I'm one of the board members of Sharp Again Naturally. Um, I'm one of our small group coaches. I've helped uh, either been the primary or secondary coach in the last five uh, small groups. And I've been working a lot with other members of our team to build that program over time. And I'm also a, a recode report practitioner, which is just kind of one of the uh, trainings for one of the major brain health um, organizations. So who are we as Sharp again, uh, for anybody who's new? Our goal is really to do kind of four things. We wanna educate the public and medical community about brain health and ways to prevent cognitive decline, empower everyone to take charge of their cognitive health, which is uh, really what we wanna do here today more than anything, you know, support lifestyle changes that can improve cognition, and then partner with like-minded professionals and organizations. And so right up here at the front, I'll just give a call since I've seen a lot of new faces. Anybody who has a community group uh, of any kind that could be, you know, a business council or your faith community, anything like that. If you wanted to invite us to speak on brain health there, we love to do that really, whoever, wherever, whenever. Uh, we can almost certainly find someone on our team to speak with you in your group. Um, key takeaways from today, and these are some of the key takeaways uh, consistently for us, it, are that the causes of memory loss are often lifestyle and environmentally driven. That, And these are kind of the overarching factors that we'll talk about today. Nutrition, exercise, sleep, and stress are four key drivers. Um, both from uh, protecting your brain from cognitive decline, but also kind of poor, poor health or poor uh, processes in these areas can be causal factors in cognitive decline in dementia. Dementia, particularly Alzheimer's, starts decades before symptoms occur, which leads to really the big headline banner idea, which is that early prevention provides the best outcomes. And that's where our some of these lifestyle factors come in. So just to give the, the one bullet point version of each lifestyle factor and what the guideline is, um, there's lots of details and nuance kind of behind each of these, but uh, the sleeping seven to nine hours per night, nutritionally eating a vegetable heavy um, good ideas. Half your plate might be vegetables and a Mediterranean style diet is the most research backed diet. Um, a combination of exercise, aerobic, weight training and stability, focusing mostly on aerobic exercise. That just means cardio for the most part um, of working up to 180 minutes of exercise a week over time. Definitely don't start doing that tomorrow if, if you're not doing it already. Um, Staying mentally active, reducing and managing stress, and then having a robust social network. And I'm not talking about you know Facebook or Instagram or something. It's uh, friends, family, community, uh, those strengthening those ties. So what are the easy changes you can make today? Um, first, I'm gonna invite everybody, I've already seen a few people taking notes, but to grab a piece of paper and write down, I'm gonna be asking you to think of questions or write down um, kind of answers to ideas or, or things, and, and maybe it would be nice to take notes as well. So if you have that around, grab something. What we really want to do in, with this webinar and these webinars in, in general, is to both educate, but also those other to empower and support and really start to create change um, either for you or, or make it at least so that the, the information sticks a little more for if you're here for a loved one. 
Okay. So what's what's the first thing? Breathe for your brain. Breathing exercises are a powerful way to reduce stress, um, clear the mind, focus in the moment, and you know, just do simple things like get oxygen to the brain. There's one particular one called Kirtan Kriya that you may want to write down and check out later. But for right now, we're going to do exactly what we do at the start of every small group program, uh, which is put each of us into the mindset of, of learning. And we're going to just do a, a brief little brain exercise or breathing exercise. So this is called boxed breathing. I'd invite everybody to just breathe along if you're comfortable doing so. So I'm going to lead it quick and we'll just do a, a couple rounds of, of boxed breathing. So it's going to be in for a four count, hold for a four count, breathe out for a four count, hold for a four count, and then we'll do that kind of box again. Okay, so Thank you. with it, everybody, breathe in. One, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, breathe out, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, Breathe out, letting your breath fall out of you and letting releasing stress as it goes. Hold, two, three, four. And for the sake of, of time, we'll just keep it to two rounds. But typically, if you do that exact exercise for, we'll say, minimum five rounds of, of that four count, you'll start to see a change of calmness. Maybe you've already seen a change of calmness in yourself right now. Um, I think especially when we're working with Zoom, kind of hectically getting to a meeting or something, um, taking a moment to just breathe and uh, kind of focus on, on the task at hand and clear away the rest of the day could be very effective. And this management of stress, uh, this helps manage stress, which is one of the key factors in keeping your brain healthy um, over time. So what's number two? Overnight fasting. Um, just simply the act of not eating for 12 hours overnight can, can work wonders. Um, it helps stabilize your blood glucose and insulin levels. It aids cell renewal and regeneration. It rests the digestive system. It reduces inflammation and it maintains body weight. So 12 hours, how hard is that? I want everyone to think of last night, what time did you eat dinner? And then this morning, what time did you eat breakfast? So for me, last night I ate dinner around 6.30 and I maybe stopped eating around 7.30, which is, um, that's actually probably earlier. That's, I, I'm glad I, I ate an early dinner last night so I can give a good example for, of this for you all which just means that I needed to not eat breakfast until 7.30 this morning, which is very easy. Um, but even if you ate a late dinner and you didn't stop eating until 9, 9.30, just delaying that breakfast until 9 or 9.30 the next morning would help provide all of these benefits. And it really just takes, for most of us, the simple act of being a little more intentional with that timing to give a full 12 hours. Um, if you want to increase to 14 or 16 hours, that uh, research suggests that that may help increase these benefits as well. Minimize evening activity. This is one of the biggest things we see in the small groups uh, making an impact. So the, this is the chief one, turn off screens two hours before bed. Um, screens for a number of reasons uh, damage your sleep quality, uh, potentially getting the blue light, activating the brain, all of these different things make it harder to fall asleep, maybe make it harder to stay asleep. And so turning off screens at least two hours before bed gives your brain the ability, the, the chance to calm down. Um, one of the tools we've 
stumbled on in the small groups or, or found work for a number of different people is um, to read a book or listen to a book or podcast, but specifically find one that you're interested in, but that's also a little boring. So something like nonfiction we found really helps because it's not like some enthralling fiction book that you wanna stay up and read. It's something that when your brain is just kind of done, it'll fall asleep and you'll stop listening. Um, especially an audio book where, or, or podcast where your brain will just kind of drift off and, and, and stop listening at some point. And then the second piece here is just exercise earlier in the day. You want to give yourself two or three hours before, um, before you sleep so that your body just isn't all hyped up from the exercise. So that minimize evening activity or excitement to the, to the brain. Okay, we talked about aerobic exercise before. I kind of said 180 minutes a week. That's what we have on screen here. But this, the easy version of this is just going for a walk. You don't need to be a superhero and be training for marathons. Um, just getting your heart rate up to what's called, you know, I'll use a little bit of technical terms, zone two heart rate, uh, which is basically getting your heart rate elevated, but such that you can still talk. And that would be really for most people, a brisk walk um, is one of the most effective forms of exercise for your health and your brain. Um, so just going for a walk and even better, and I may be stealing a little thunder from one of the later easy ones, but weaving that walk into your day, exercise doesn't have to be this big chore you go do and, oh, I've got to go exercise. It can just be, uh, you know, a brisk walk to the grocery store and back. For most of us, that might be 15 minutes each way, and then you've got your 30 minutes of walking in, uh, and your heart rate is raised, or some some version of that. You're on the phone with a friend, and just go for a walk while you're doing that um, with your headphones on. Um, so walking. Uh, last piece on walking. I forget the specific. Uh, statistic offhand, so I don't want to misquote it, but going from sedentary to just simply walking has shown to have a, a pretty substantial decrease in cognitive decline. Okay, mindful eating. Um, I'm going to flash up a bunch of nutritional information on screen quick, and these are sort of the things we talk about. Limiting carbs, adding fats, hydrating, improving vitamins and minerals, eliminating artificial flavors and colors, minimizing pesticides. But I'm going to take all of that away again, because the point of that is that there's a lot of complicated nutrition here. There's a lot of different rules. It, you might see it in different places. Nutritional experts agree. Um, I actually use two books in some of the small groups and just highlight for people where they disagree and they disagree often when it comes to nutritional information. Um, and so what, instead of focusing on all that difficult stuff, the easiest version that we've begun to use is these overarching guidelines. What are the actual tools I can use every day? And this question is highly effective for that. We, we kind of know intuitively what's healthy for us and we can tune that knowledge over time but just asking the question how will this make me feel before you eat a meal um, is going to provide a huge impact and be a really simple way to start making your nutrition more brain healthy um, another tip that's not going to be on the slide but it's maybe all the pictures on the right that you can use as a second tool is just eating whole foods uh, kind of the less processed, the more whole food vegetables and things, the better. So, all right. Use and stretch your brain. Um, staying mentally active is one of the most important things for brain health. Um, you want to be kind of regularly feeling that stretching or stressing uh, using your brain um, because making new connections and create and sparking the brain processes that are involved in making new brain connections 
is one of the things that keeps your brain healthy. So the research recommends doing things that like uh, learning, you know, even listening to music, but even more so learning an instrument or picking up an instrument you used to play, um, hobbies, starting new hobbies, returning to old hobbies, learning, you're here, so you got that one checked. Um, we won't call this a class because, but classes like auditing a class in a college or setting, maybe locally for you or even doing online things um, as we've all started doing more so in the last couple of years or trying a, phys a new physical activity. Um, just, we often forget that our, our brain and, and neurons that we use in physical activities are, are kind of directly connected to the brain. So learning something new physically, maybe learning, uh, going to a dance class or trying yoga, or if you're a runner trying biking or I don't know, something new to you that sounds fun. Um, that is a, a brain exercise as well. Okay, so be social again. Um, being social, we are social beings. Our brains, huge portions of our brain are directed to uh, processing and navigating social situations, processing uh, the emotions of the people we are with, making conversation. All of these different things are huge parts of our brain. And so we need to be exercising those parts of our brain, but also just huge parts of having a fulfilling life as a person are social. And so I've included this one on here in particular because I think um, the pandemic has really eroded away our opportunities to have social impacts. So since finding, thinking of just one way to have an additional social interaction that you would enjoy that's fun in the next week, maybe it's a phone call um, maybe it's grabbing outdoor coffee with somebody or trying a new restaurant if, if that's safe in your area. And I would just encourage everyone to either think in their head right now or uh, actually write down a plan or a friend or a family member that they're going to reach out to and be uh, add a little bit of that kind of social connection back in. Maybe some of you are even feeling a little socially overloaded. And I think I've, I've heard some of that from people because we've been catching up on two years of social interaction. So if you're already overloaded, feel free to not write that one down. <laughs> okay, so this is a little bit of the one I alluded to earlier. Um, I think shifting our focus from exercising to living an active life can be helpful. Um, exercise is like a chore that you schedule and you have to go do. Living actively just uh, would be uh, weaving fitness, I guess, into activities of daily life. So I've got, there's a bunch of benefits of exercise on the side of the screen if you wanna read through those. But really the easy thing that we're talking about here is let's say you live in a condo building T doing simple things like taking the stairs or like I said earlier walking with a friend or we're all sitting right now at our desk and maybe we do that for a lot of hours a day and so just keeping a couple small weights by so that when we're every time we yawn you uh, you know do a little exercise quick or if you're watching TV uh, regularly live TV um, and when commercials come on you just kind of get up and and do some sort of stretching exercise or something just weaving in the activity as a habit throughout the day that just naturally happens as opposed to having to motivate to do some big Herculean uh, version of exercise where you got to get in the car and go to the gym or motivate put on all your exercise clothes um, just being active throughout the day provides a lot of the benefits that you're looking for for your brain. Um, the other thing I'll just mention here is that to get all the these positive brain benefits, you don't actually need to exercise to some extreme level. 
that uh, 180 minutes, three hours a week, including cardio, which can be brisk walking, is, is actually a pretty manageable thing when you realize it doesn't need to be some extreme version. Okay. Raise your hand if you had a cup of coffee this morning. I had two, so I'll raise both hands. Um, the quarter life of a cup of coffee or caffeine in general, so maybe you drink soda or tea, is 12 hours. So if you had two cups of coffee by 10 a.m. this morning, you'll still have a half a cup of coffee in your bed or in your, in, I'm thinking I have sleep on the brain. You'll have a half a cup of coffee when you're starting to go to bed, to bed around 10 p.m. tonight. Um, so just and why do we care about that? Well, we know caffeine keeps us awake. Um, so caffeine actually works by basically blocking the receptors that adenosine, our sleepiness molecule or sleep pressure molecule binds to that actually helps create or initiate sleep. And so if we still have half a quarter or half a cup of coffee in our system with just two cups in the morning, we're not giving our body the full ability to be sleepy. We're still blocking a good amount of that adenosine as we're falling asleep. So what's the easy uh, habit here? Really limit or reduce your caffeine consumption and push it early enough in the day so that by the time you're going to sleep at night, it's all out of your system. You don't have to not have the coffee necessarily, but if you're having six cups of coffee or something, um, you're still going to have a several cups of coffee in, in your body when you're going to sleep. So try and push that cup of coffee earlier in the day and get it down to a reasonable amount of coffee so that when you're doing the math and thinking, oh, um, I don't want to have a cup of coffee basically still in my system when I'm sleeping. The other thing to just mention in relation to this uh, is that sleep quality is is a, pretty much as important as sleep quantity so sleep is not just seven to nine hours of sleep so if you can fall asleep with a, a cup of coffee some people might even have a cup of coffee right before they go to bed and think oh i could go to bed uh, just fine with that cup of coffee the quality of your sleep um, is still very important because you're trying to hit a bunch of different sleep processes in there and you might be losing some of those really good sleep processes um, if particularly different forms of deep sleep, if you're having a low sleep quality as a result of caffeine. Same thing goes for basically everything I said, except for the half-life part. But if you're having sugar or alcohol right before bed, sugar can cause some insulin spikes or blood sugar spikes that affect sleep quality and alcohol right before bed um, affects your deep sleep um, and disrupts those sleep processes as well. So with alcohol, it's not that you have to stop drinking, but just be mindful of not uh, having tons of alcohol in your system before you go to bed. Um, and fluids is, is just watching bathroom breaks during the night. Okay. Plan time for you. Ooh. Stress uh, and cortisol have negative impacts on the brain. So if you've got all this stress in your life, maybe um, you got, it's a lot of work stress or a lot of stressful, um, you know, million different ways stress could be entering our life. But if we are constantly getting stress and cortisol at high levels, uh, that negatively impacts the brain. And we see this often with caregivers of people with cognitive decline or dementia. And so if that fits you, if you're a caregiver or just anybody, um, planning time for you in, at any level. And so the easy version of that is I'm going to say for everybody, write down, let's just say, start with whatever the easiest amount of time. Maybe, maybe you can do an hour but start with five minutes of, that are just for you somewhere away from stressors. Maybe it's in the small group that could, we've had, you know, different people that's just maybe going for a drive and you don't need to go anywhere. 
to do that. It's just getting out of the house and getting away from the stressors or, um, you know, going for a walk in nature. That's just for you. But take a moment right now to just plan either the rest of today or tomorrow, some place or time that you can just take just for you um, with an eye towards kind of reducing stress and clearing away all of those different stressors. Okay, number 11, make less decisions. Um, we've talked about 10 things already. We've hit on six different lifestyle factors right at the beginning. Changing all of these things is a lot. And even these easy things we're talking about, the easiest versions of things, you know, adding this or that in, um, it can require a lot of willpower and motivation. Each of those decisions, you know, taking the stairs, uh, asking yourself, how will I feel after I eat this? Um, you know, even you know, being social, all of those things can take a little bit of willpower and motivation. And so reducing the number of decisions you need to make can be very effective. So instead of, so creating habits and routine, um, what types of habits and routine are we talking about? Exercise is a good example. Um, if you just, if, if it becomes a habit that you exercise every Tuesdays at 8 p.m. or 6 p.m. right after work or um, 10 a.m. when you wake up, and that's just what you do on Tuesdays and Thursdays, there's not this big motivating uh, mental gymnastics you have to do to get yourself out the door. Or you have, have, have the habit of having a bag of all the workout clothes you need to get out the door for a walk. Um, then your decisions are lower. I think a good um, example of this would be something like grocery shopping versus making healthy decisions at the grocery store versus making the healthy decisions coming right out of your cabinet. If you Choose, if you decide to just buy all the things that you know are healthy for you, you don't have to constantly be having the willpower and motivation to be every time you open the cabinet up making the decision, okay, I'm going to eat this instead of that. So thinking of maybe the previous 10 things, let's take a pause right now and just write down, and I want to encourage kind of this for all of those things. There's probably a million, your brain's probably going off in a million directions. So I could do this, I could do that, I should do this. Um, write down one easy, simple, it should be so simple that uh, you could do it tomorrow, a new habit or an old habit that worked really well for you that you know works and that you like, but maybe fell by the wayside at some point. That's even better. Just Write that down. Okay. Um, finally, number 12 is find community accountability and support. Um, including family and friends and, or in or the joining something like the small group program or joining a fitness class um, or getting some sort of professional support. Maybe that's health coaching. Maybe it's working with a nutritionist or a doctor. These are very effective tools um, to implement all of these healthy factors and even the easiest versions. Like the health is very complicated. It, a lot of these involve changing large parts of your life potentially. And so taking it one step at a time, but having support in the form of, I think family, a lot of these, you probably have to get somebody else on board. If you have a family who you live with uh, and you wanna start eating differently, you kind of have to get, get everybody on board with, with some new recipes or with a new way of cooking. 
Um, and so if, uh, I think I would encourage everyone to just mentally choose one of these categories. Um, I will think of a family or a friend that you need, that might be helpful to get on board. Maybe it's a friend that you set up a weekly phone call with to go walking, or maybe you join the next small group. And I will tell you a little bit more about that later to continue and, and jump off and do the healthy, adding all these brain healthy lifestyles, factor changes or fitness classes can be a really effective thing or just having a, a fitness partner of any kind where we're doing number 11, you're taking away the decision. If you've signed up for a class, and especially if they know you're going to be there, there's a little bit of social pressure, some, some of that accountability and support um, to do, to, to go to that class or uh, community. I think a, a little bit of this is that at least probably most of you are on our email list, or you're at least in some, some brain related or health related group. We'll great, you've already found a community um, in some format that brought you here. And that's kind of popping up and surfacing these healthy things into your feed. Um, and so you've got one community, what's a way uh, to, to leverage that to add one more thing? Um, so I'll give everybody a moment to just think about that or if you're here with somebody else, maybe discuss it since they're on mute. And then I'll talk about the, the small group program. So our small group program is uh, six coaching sessions, two one-to-one -one sessions, and uh, each session includes some education and resources. But really, what, what are we doing? What is the point of the small group program? Um, the point of the small group program is to do exactly what we've talked about. We're creating a community around improving brain health. We work, everybody sets their individual um, goals to improve their own health and they, we work together. It's very helpful to hear what other people are working on and support each other in moving towards um, a healthier lifestyle for the brain. We have um, very exciting progress from a lot of our participants and, and good testimonials. We have a number of people who continually you know, keep joining new groups or refer people from other groups. We've been running these groups for, I think about a year and a half ago was our, our first one. Um, we're updating them every time. You can read some of the testimonials there. Um, and I think we have an opportunity. Yes, so Sue, if you wanted to tell everybody about the half off special. Yeah, um, sure. So one thing that I just wanted to say, um, hi, I'm, I'm Sue Lynn, I'm the executive director of Sharpie and Naturally. Um, one thing I did wanna say, and I wanted to point out is Steve mentioned that um, the small groups are an opportunity to um, create a healthier lifestyle for the brain. But if you read those testimonials, you'll see it's not only a healthier lifestyle for the brain, it's just a healthier lifestyle overall. Um, it's encouraging socialization. It's helping people to make better and smarter nutritional choices that are manifesting positively in you know, their, their physical being. Um, they're losing weight, they're feeling better, their health issues are resolving. Um, their energy levels are improving because they're exercising more. So there's the brain and the body are so interrelated. And by focusing on the brain, you, they're getting the added benefit of, of helping their body and their mindfulness as well. So I cannot stress enough the value the small group program has had to the people who go through the program. And I do also want to just say quickly, it is not for people who, not only for people who are experiencing, um, early cognitive decline. It's also for people who are looking to prevent it. And you know, thankfully Western medicine is catching up with the rest of the world and we're focusing more on prevention and making these smart choices by understanding what you can do now will hopefully prevent you from having the experience of having cognitive decline and the, the havoc it wreaks with 
your family and your friends. And, you know, it's not just you, it's your entire social network that's impacted by the ability of dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, so I, I do want to stress that, you know, you don't need to be suffering from cognitive decline to truly, truly benefit from being in this group. Um, groups are exceptional. It's not like you're just sitting in a group talking to people. They are moderated by health coaches. You have a meeting with a health coach both before and after the program. So things are tailored to your specific needs. Um, I would urge you to go onto our website and learn more about the program and email us and we'll set up a phone call or a Zoom call and we can talk to you about the program and the benefits and you can see if it's right for you. Um, but Steve, if you wanna to jump to the next slide, we do have a program that's starting September 21st. And for this webinar group only, we are offering a 50% discount on registration, but you have to email us at sharpermines at sharpagains.org because we have to register you a different way. Um, we only take a maximum of eight people in any small group and we're over halfway there. So if you are interested in taking advantage of the program, I urge you to reach out to us today or tomorrow at the latest. You must register by Friday because we have to have the next week to schedule your one-on-one -on -one coaching session. Um, and again, feel free to reach out, ask questions. Um, if it's not for this group, for the next group, but seriously, give it a go. Thanks, yeah. Steve. And, and if you're not interested in this group and you're interested in future groups, just send us an email and, and we can keep you on the list. And I will say, I, I'm so glad Sue made one of those points because with regard to this group, but also brain health in general and everything we just talked about, one of the most fortunate things is if we're doing prevention, all of these lifestyle factors, as I'm sure you already know, it's not just for the brain. Um, it's not like you're working towards just brain health for some time in the future. If you make these changes, um, it's improving all kinds, your energy level, all kinds of other health benefits. And, and we see that over and over with just the small group participants, but also all the people we come in contact with. There's another webinar um, on Thursday, sorry. Thursday, September 23rd. Um, that one's at in the evening, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern time, and it's eating for brain health. So nutrition is one of the most complex parts of the kind of brain health or just really living a healthy lifestyle. And so we have a full webinar focusing just on that because that's where the devil is in the details. It's really helpful to get a little bit more information on it. So that registration, I believe, is already live. Um, and finally, I think it's time for, I'll just keep this slide up, um, so that people can write down our website or email, but really this is questions time. Um, so I, I know one, 12 things is a lot. Um, so, and we didn't dive too deep into any of the science, but part of that is because, uh, we wanted to leave questions. And, at, and see where, if anybody, where the questions are. What do you want to hear more about? We have 15 minutes um, for questions or so, and that's usually how much I like to leave. So I don't know if there's questions in the chat. Um, yeah, Steve, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one is, does TV count as a screen or is it just phones and computers when you're talking about um, taking time off of screens at night? I think, yes, I, I think TV, TV certainly counts as a screen for me. Um, I would say it probably counts for everyone, but I, I think anything that you notice keeps your brain too awake to really start falling asleep. If you, let's say, if you want to go to sleep at 11 or 10, and you watch, you do that activity, I think TV is, is this for a lot of people, right up until you go to bed. Um, are you able to, are you sleepy? Are you falling asleep at that moment when you turn that screen off or are you still awake and you need to spend a half hour or 45 minutes just kind of laying in bed before you can get to sleep? Um, so. Uh, next question. Can you explain how alcohol interferes with sleep? Yeah. So, um, specifically alcohol interferes with your deep sleep. And so one of the things that happens when 
you really just have alcohol still in your system is it reduces the amount, uh, the, okay. One of the things that happens during deep sleep is, de is a detoxification. So while you're asleep, you, you know, have these neurons called glial cells that literally kind of contract and then make space in your brain for your cerebral spinal fluid to kind of flow in and uh, almost wash away the brain and kind of carries away toxins. And so when you have when you have alcohol still in your system, when you're going to sleep, especially significant amounts, um, it interferes with that level of deep sleep, which results in kind of the lack of ability to do the, the detoxification. Um, Can you repeat the amount of time it takes caffeine to get out of the system totally? So it's the what they say is a quarter the quarter life is 12 hours. Um, so you would still have a quarter of your whatever you drank 12 hours ago. So if you have one cup of coffee, it's a quarter cup of coffee in 12 hours later. If you've had four, it's a one cup of coffee, which is a, 12 hours is a long time. Um, and so you really have to think if I'm trying to go to bed at 10 p.m., what am I drinking at 10 a.m.? Um, or around then, and a, a fourth of that is what you still have in your system. Thanks, Steve. Um, if anybody has any more questions, if you want to type them in the chat or raise your hand, we're happy to answer them. We have a little bit of time left. Yeah, and I can really dive deeper into any of those topics if we want to hear more about sleep for a few minutes. Um, these are you know, I, I think what would really be helpful, um, I know we didn't talk about um, environmental toxins or, or anything along those lines because we're trying to keep this really limited to 12 things. But can you also talk about how important it is to just maintain a healthy environment and, and you know, how that can impact your brain, your sleep, your stress levels? Sure. So I think the easiest way to understand all of a lot of these things um, is that inflammation is a mediating factor or kind of the mechanism of harm with all, specifically Alzheimer's, but with a, a broad, more broadly cognitive decline. Um, so anything that can cause inflammation in your body um, can be something that, that creates brain harm, you know, harm for your brain. So, you know, the things we talk about here of all of these, you know, exercise, exercise can help reduce inflammation, but it, lack of exercise in, increases inflammation. That's kind of one of the ways that may cause harm. Nutrition, um, same thing, poor nutrition, especially, you know, things like sh high levels of sugar, high levels of trans fats, those sorts of things can create inflammation and cause harm. Um, and kind of down the line, stress and cortisol is inflammatory, and that's one of the ways. So all the things we just talked about, one of the ways that cause harm is inflammation. And there are other things that cause inflammation, and, and some of those things have their own harms. But for example, um, pollution um, is one that we, has been linked to Alzheimer's. So there's, uh, in, in places, I don't think anybody raised their hand for being in the West, but I was up in New York not too long ago and it was very smoky um, from the West. And so those sorts of things have been linked to cognitive decline over time. And one of the one of the ways those causes harm is inflammation. So managing kind of those environmental toxins. Um, other things like that could be mold in your home. Those are can be very damaging and, and cause inflammation. There's really an endless list of things that are inflammatory uh, that could be a factor. You should, it's important to not, you know, just feel like you need to change everything and attack. You know, if you read uh, about this, and anything can cause inflammation, right? It's, you should kind of try and do a bit of an evaluation in your own life of like, what, what maybe is causing inflammation? Do I live near a bunch of busy roads and freeways, maybe the tailpipe emissions from those might be a bigger factor for me. So managing that or 
um, you know, where might things that are harming me come from and, and look into it. Uh, if that's a big concern, you may talk to your doctor about getting some inflammation testing and uh, they would know what those tests are. Thank you. Um, we do have a couple more questions. Um, does Kindle count as a screen? And I'm sure that the individual was talking about e-readers in general. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually thought of that. And that was part of why I talked when, when I mentioned that. So I think that's really up to you. Like, I think a Kindle, it could be uh, either way. You probably don't want to be like, have the brightness on full. Uh, I think a, a, a good thing with the Kindle, actually, the thing you want to do when you're reading a Kindle, and this is like in the instructions to the Kindle, is you want to match the brightness of your Kindle with the brightness of the room you're in. So if you're in like, if you're on the beach, turn the brightness all the way up so you can see it really well. If you're in a dark room, you barely need to have a backlight on at all to, to, to read. Um, and, but with a Kindle, you're basically reading a book. That's one of the benefits of it. That e-ink screen isn't uh, kind of the same thing. And, um, but that's why I gave the guideline of anything that's sort of keeping you awake is something to pay attention to. Great. Um, and what are your top suggestions for improving deep sleep besides no screens two hours before and little caffeine in the system? Uh, specifically deep sleep. I'm not sure what things you would do to improve just deep sleep, but I think the overarching recommendation there would be um, really like routine for and creating good overarching sleep hygiene. So sleeping the same hours every, every night is important to getting all the different types of, of sleep because they actually occur at different times in the night. So you have deep sleep and REM sleep at different times. They occur more prevalently and longer at different times in the night. And so if you're sleeping, if you're changing what times you sleep, your, your body actually uh, because of the circadian rhythms will actually get less of one kind of sleep and maybe more of another. And so making sure to kind of create that routine and therefore a more, um, I don't know, durable circadian rhythm will promote all of the levels of sleep. And then beyond that, sleep hygiene is a, a term. Um, but really what that means is just having really good um, routines, you know, around sleep. So watching that caffeine early in the day and don't drink caffeine late at night. Um, no screens before bed. No, I mean, we have a, a list of like 25 things that you can do. Um, so I can go more into those, but that's the basic idea. Do thing, try and weed out things that harm your sleep and add in things that would promote your sleep in general. Um, I guess that does beg the question of how would you even know if you're getting more or less deep or regular sleep? Some people might use a, deep, a sleep tracker. What they say, a, a small note on the sleep trackers, what kind of the sleep professionals say about sleep trackers today or like at home sleep trackers. I don't have it on, but I use an aura ring. Is there like directionally accurate, but they're not uh, like actually accurate on the amount of time. So it's, if it says you spend uh, an hour in deep sleep, that may be less or wrong, but if it says you spent an hour one day and an hour and a half the next, that's a, that increase is a little more reliable, but it might be totally wrong about the hour, hour and a half. Thank you. Um, another question about creating habits and routine. Uh, it seems to go against the thought that it's better to challenge the brain by doing things differently instead mm -hmm. of doing them the same way all the time. I realize routine is best for sleep, but yeah. can you talk about how changing things up helps your brain other than sleep? Yeah. So I would say like routine should be, you know, like variety is the spice of life, right? So great. Definitely have variety, but routine is a thing, is a tool for implementing things where you don't really want variety. There are parts of this where, you know, you don't necessarily, maybe you want variety like in this, within the box of routine in some cases. So 
uh, you want to be eating healthy. You don't want to be, you don't want the variety of eating really poorly and eating really unhealthfully. So the routine of like buying fruits and vegetables, that's the routine. Maybe you buy different fruits and vegetables or you buy fruits and vegetables from the grocery store and bring them home. Um, that the routine is buying healthfully at the grocery store. Um, or uh, routine can be a simple, it can be just like times of day you do things. If if ex if you can exercise without any routine, tell me your secrets. But for me, having a time, you know, 6 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays that I exercise, you might do different exercises at those times. And that's the variety. But relying on the routine of the when and the habit so you don't have to make 100 different decisions to get yourself there. But you're right uh, from the perspective of doing different things and breaking out of routine can be a huge, can probably be a, a way to stretch your brain. Almost certainly is, especially depending on the way you do it, so. Thank you. Um, back to nutrition again. Do you suggest we limit meat, poultry, and fish, and to what extent? Uh, not as a broad category necessarily. Uh, um, I, and what the, what the guidelines say is you should reduce um, red meat and especially saturated fats from animals, uh, from animal sources. Poultry is kind of put up as the, the main meat you should be eating if you're eating meat. And then fish is actually uh, at least not fish that could have mercury in it. Um, which are generally the smaller fish. Um, one tool to use is smash fish, salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sartine, sardines, and herring um, as the, the fish that don't have mercury and, and have brain health. But fish are actually one of the huge primary sources of the best fatty acids for the brain. So we think of you might the, the thing that'll actually be on your nutrition label is polyunsaturated fats, but un, as a subcategory of polyunsaturated fats, and maybe this is in the advertising for some things, is omega three fatty acids, and the two that are really you might see on like a supplement or a fish oil thing is the EPA and DHA are the two fatty acids that are in fish uh, in fish oils that are really brain healthy. So definitely not an overarching reduce everything. It's kind of a make sure you're getting the good versions of things and, and, and focusing on chicken and fish or poultry and fish. Great. Um, what tests are there for inflammation? Probably the main one. And if you go back and look at your last physical, you maybe would have had this is uh, high sensitivity, high sensitivity C-reactive protein is kind of the overarching main source of inflammation. And, and there are other more, more detailed tests. I think homocysteine is often used in relation to inflammation. Um, and even um, some like lipid tests uh, can have a relationship to inflammation. Great. Um, I think we need to kind of start wrapping things up. Great. So thank you everyone for taking the time to put your questions in the chat. And if you've got any additional questions after the webinar, you can always email us. Um, you can send your inquiries to sharperminds at sharpagain.org and we'll be happy to get back to you. Okay, Steve, you have any parting words? No, other than I very much recommend the whole, my at least personal goal with these webinars, especially as a health coach, is to not just have these webinars be educational, but to spark action. So that's why I was constantly asking everyone to think of something or write something down. So look at that piece of it, paper, hopefully, or all those thoughts you had, and just literally pick one. Don't do the 12, don't do 12 things. That would be probably an unsustainable approach. Pick one for tomorrow. And if you wanna set one for you know the weekend or next week, but just pick one thing and uh, to take one easy step forward and try and choose something that you know you'll actually be able to make a habit and, and build on in the future rather than trying to 
reach the moon in the first, first day. And a reminder that we will be sending everyone a link to the recording. Um, you'll probably have it tomorrow morning or by the end of the day today. So go back and listen to it again and take notes. Thank you everybody for coming and uh, please feel free to reach out with anything else. And I hope to be seeing you all um, at the next webinar in small groups. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you.